Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Eagle. I invite you to come on in, and if you'll stand with me as we open with worship. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you this morning because you alone are worthy of our praise. And Lord, we do just lay our mornings, we lay our weeks at your feet, and just ask, Lord, that you would come and wash over us. Lord, that you would renew us. Lord, that you'd refresh us in your presence. So, Lord, we just give you this time of worship, and we, we just ask, Lord, that you would be pleased with our worship, Lord, that we would fix our eyes on you, that you would be glorified, and that you would be lifted up this morning. We love you, Lord, and we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.
like to teach you another new song this morning. It's called Impossible Things.
so thankful for your amazing grace that you cover us with. Lord, we know that we couldn't live this life without it. Lord, we need you. We need your presence. We need your Holy Spirit. We need all that you are in us, Lord. We worship you this morning. Welcome to sit down at this time, but you're also welcome to remain standing. The Lord's my portion, I shall not. shall not fear. Yea, though I walk through the valley low, yea, though the path gets steep, surely Oh, my 
good shepherd. You lead us beside still waters. Lord, in your presence, we find rest. We find peace. We find comfort. We worship you. you stand with us.
thank you for your presence. May we never take it for granted that just because we don't see you here, Lord, that you are not fully present. We worship you, Lord. Lord, we just ask that you would have your way in us today. Give us ears to hear and give us a heart that is willing to listen. We love you, Lord. We give you this time in Jesus' name. Go ahead and take this time and say hello to someone sitting near you. Well, good morning, Calvary Chapel Eagle. Hi, Lonnie. Fellowship time goes for a long time here at this church. And the police are here. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to the coolest church in town on this hot Sunday morning. Some verses came to my mind as uh, earlier this week, but boy, I think it goes with the worship music here. This is Joshua 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, now Moses' assistant, how do you put that on a resume? That would be quite the interesting thing. But God is saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise Go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the soil of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. That's a lot of area. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, as I will 
As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and good, and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all law, all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord God is with you wherever you go. Now that ministered to me, and I'm sure it ministers to everybody who's going through changes. We're empty nesters for the first time in 24 years as of two weeks ago. So, I mean, that's a, something my wife and I are kind of working through. But just uh, people that moved up here from California and stuff, it's a new land, man. It's a new footprint for you to walk on. So, But I'm here to do announcements, too. So... <laughs> Um, this week is the children's ministry promotion time. So you have dropped them off into one classroom, and they will be moving to another one as if they have moved up in, in age groups. And next week you will be dropping them off in their new class as they have moved up. Um, there's a power of prayer today at noon, which uh, uh, the address is in, in, your, uh, in, the, in the announcements. Uh, on Wednesday is the Acts 242 Fellowship, the Book of Daniel, uh, the Wednesday, Wednesday night meeting down at the Eagle Senior Center in, in Eagle, so bring some food to share. It's also the week for the young ladies uh, to have their Bible study, and it meets at the same time in the same place uh, there at the Eagle uh, Senior Center. Um, also, the Eagle Assisted Living uh, would like to have a Sunday afternoon service, so if the Lord moves on your heart to be a part of a ministry uh, to lead a, uh, a small service at, at the Eagle Assisted Living. Uh, they're currently, they currently have an LDS service, and once a month they have a Catholic Mass, and they are really looking for a Christian service. So um, if, somebody, you know, if the Lord moves in your heart, uh, check with Pastor on that. Um, if you're visiting with us today, we welcome you. Uh, here is a uh, welcome package that we have on the front on the table in the hallway so you know please pick one up they're for you to take it looks a lot better than this one because this one's been in our bag and it's kind of beat up so those are, are a lot prettier so just grab one of those or ask one of the ushers for they'll they'll send you in the right direction and get it for you now something that's coming up uh, baptism and barbecue planning meeting. We're going to be having that today uh, after service. It's going to be in some uh, tables at the back end of the uh, cafeteria. So we're looking for people uh, who want to help with the, with the barbecue, which is on uh, the end of the month, July 30th. So uh, we need your help on, on setting that up and planning for it. Because the all church baptism and barbecue is on July 30th, which is our normal uh, day for having our pop luck and so we're going to have uh, you know bring a side dish and dessert we're going to have activities outside and it's going to be 85 degrees and just a slight breeze to keep everybody cool so we're praying for that right now um, and so uh, and Linda you told me something but I think I said it did I say it I think okay yeah okay yeah, we're going to be scheduling games and stuff like that, out, outside activities to really enjoy it. And also, since it is church baptism and barbecue, those of you who would like to be baptized, we have this um, information sheet on being baptized. It's on the table just going inside the cafeteria there. So please pick this up, and it just educates you on what baptism is in, in, in Christianity. So... Uh, don't forget to get this. If you pick this up and sign up for it, pastor will be contacting you and going over what uh, will take place during the baptism, and uh, it will be a special blessing for you to 
make that move to be baptized in front of your church. So, um, at the end of the service today, we will also be having prayer up front. So, if you need to have uh, prayers for any any need, uh, please come forward uh, after service. So, and right now, Lord God, we just ask in Jesus' name that you just anoint Pastor as he is up here speaking your word to us, Lord. Open the hearts of each and every individual in this church and who is listening into the massive audience online, Lord. And we just give you honor and glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I'm going to lower this mic for a short guy now. Yeah, Jeff and his wife do our prayer ministry and many other things around the church. And so if you ever need prayer after church, they will always be here up to the right-hand side of the stage. And uh, remember that. Uh, don't forget that after church, I don't always remember to announce it after the message. It doesn't always flow. We're just moving along here. But if you need prayer for any reason whatsoever, you come on up. We've got a whole team of prayer people. It's not a counseling time. You're not going to get some a lecture, okay? You get some prayer. So take advantage of that. Uh, again, uh, one more thing about the, the um, baptism. That's a good shot, Mike. We'll leave it there. Uh, one more good thing, uh, important thing about the baptism is that you don't have to have high qualifications. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. Uh, to get baptized, just you, you have to be saved, accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and want to tell the world about it. Because baptism is, a, is an outward expression of an inward happening. You're telling the world, I want, to, I want you to know that I've died with Christ. I've been raised up again in newness of life. I'm a Christian. And it also is a step of faith of identifying with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. And so, you know, that's important. So if you've been, here's something I'd want you to think about. Some of us, like myself, I was baptized as a baby. But I don't remember it. Do you remember it? And when I, when I got saved, I thought, I want, to, I want to make a public profession. And I got baptized over again. It's okay. Matter of fact, I think it's good to get baptized when you know what you're doing, okay? So if you've been baptized as a child and you feel like, you know what, now I really know what I'm doing, now I'm really following Jesus and I want to make a statement and I want to make a stand for Christ, you sign up. Make sure that you sign up so I know because we, we get that baptism all heated up. Not really. Uh, we set up a baptism uh, for those of you from California, it's a horse trough. And so we, we, we set it up, and it's, it works just fine. Uh, the horse has never used it, so it's clean. Okay, there's no slobber, no horse slobber in there, okay? Um, and so we want to do that knowing that there's people actually signed up to be baptized. And uh, I had a mother today ask me uh, about questions for her son. You know, the only age requirement or anything there is I just want pick up the sheet that I've put out there about baptism, read it over, maybe go, to, go over it with your children if one of your children want to be baptized, make sure they understand it, and if there's still questions, uh, I'd be glad to meet with your kids or with you personally, because I want to make sure that you enter into this knowing what you're doing, all right? Okay, hopefully you've turned already to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and I'm going to do a little review here first before we get too deep along the way, is that if you remember, the Apostle Paul actually planted the church in Corinth on his second missionary journey. And as a matter of fact, he stayed with the Corinthian believers longer than any other group of Christians that we know about in the New Testament. He stayed 18 months after he went there, planted a church, people got saved. He stayed 18 months teaching the people, discipling them. He poured into them. So they, they might be a little bit more important to him than others when you know somebody and you've invested in somebody, you know what I mean? So this is important to him. He stayed 18 months, and then he did move on in his second missionary journey and went on to, to other mission fields. But you know how the flesh is, because you probably are all wearing flesh just like me. It didn't take long after Paul moved on and after he went on to other mission fields that the Corinthian believers began to have some problems. Imagine that, church problems. And, and the Corinthian believers actually showed themselves to be pretty carnal in many ways. Uh, in chapter, when we get to chapter 5, we'll see they, there was sexual immorality. We'll have fun going through that chapter. Pretty wild stuff that, they, that some of them were into or allowed. And one of the things that became prominent, we talked about 
a couple weeks ago, is that there was competition and pride, like, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. You know, they're trying to start denominations already, you know, in the early church. There's only one church, but within the church, it's like, well, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm a, I'm a Peterite, you know. And, they, and they're into the stop it. We talk about the importance of unity in Christ, and it's okay to, to enjoy one teacher be, uh, over others. We can't all be excellent, but don't divide over it. And so we, we talked about that. And so, but it just all shows their carnality. And, and much of it was based upon, I'd say, two major things. One is their intellectualism, because they were, they were Greek philosophers, you know, the Corinth and Athens and Greece. They were the place of, of intellectual wisdom and philosophy, and that, that could be a dangerous thing. That could be a good thing, but it would be a dangerous thing, because you think that you know something, but you're really nothing, you know. And, and so intellectualism could be deceiving. And then... What was behind all that, of course, was pride. And so the focus of the Corinthian church soon became who was greater than who, who was the better teacher, who was the greater apostle. And, and so Paul wrote, I've already told you this, but review, Paul wrote the book of 1 Corinthians basically to put out fires. There's a lot of other books in the New Oral Testament that are filled with doctrine and teaching. And, you know, it's all filled with doctrine. We'll get doctrine, trust me. But Corinthians was a corrective letter to deal with problems in the church. And I thought it was quite appropriate since we finished the book of Acts to go right into Corinthians because every church is going to have growing pains. We've been around maybe six years now, Calvary Chapel Eagle. We're going, we've always gone through growing pains and different things. It's been a good journey. I'm grateful. I appreciate you and, and love you all. Um, but just forewarned is forearmed. You know, I don't really want forearms, but you know what I mean. And so when you're forewarned and you study the scripture, you're aware of the kinds of troubles that arise in the church and you can seek to avoid them. And so Paul writes this letter to put out fires and to correct problems in their midst. And so those of you who have your fill-in in the insert, your first fill-in is this. Paul's aim was to get the, Christian, the Corinthian Christians to think biblically. And that should be the goal of every pastor. I don't want you to think like me because I'm a little weird, okay? I want you to think biblically. And when we think biblically, we don't all think exactly alike. Well, there's differences. There's, very, there's a reason God made us all a little different. But basically, the goal of every pastor should be to teach his church to think biblically. And that's what Paul's trying to teach the people of Corinth. And we'll look at that verse as we review. But first, Father, I pray that you just have your way in our midst. I pray, Lord God, that you would help us to think biblically, that we'd understand the scriptures, that we would embrace the scriptures, that we would live according to the scriptures, that we'd walk in the spirit and be a biblical people who know your word and live it out. And so, Father, once more, we're here for training. We're here for building up that you equip us for the work of the ministry as we look at your word today. Feed us by your word, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, where we left off in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 was verse 6. And let me just show you what I mean. And Paul says, For these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself an apostles for your sakes. Remember, he gave different figures of speech, and he was talking about the apostles. And he says this, That you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written. That means think biblically. Don't be, go beyond what the Bible says. That none of you would be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. You know how you prevent pride problems? You know the word. Which I know some people know the word and they're proud about it. Stop it. You know? But if you really understand the Bible, you realize you've got no reason to be proud. It troubles me when I meet somebody and they say, well, you know, I, I have a pride problem. I mean, help me, Lord, but one of the first things that usually comes out of my mouth is I look at them and I go, what do you got to be proud of? I can't help it. Because in reality, when you know the Lord and you know what you're made of, you've got no reason to be proud. We just need to cling to Jesus. It's not like, yeah, look at me. Oh, boy. So Paul is dealing with their pride problem. So uh, to get this point across in our next text, we're just going to take a few verses. We'll take two more weeks, this week and next week, to finish this chapter. Uh, to get his point across, the Apostle Paul put forth Four contrasts in the next few verses 
contrast between himself and the Corinthian believers. And, and, but Paul first starts out with, with three questions. And by the way, there's just a few small groups still meeting, and you're going to go over these things, so pay attention, because I want you to discuss them and explore them. And, and so the three questions are designed to humble the proud Corinthians. We'll start with verse 7 here. Paul says, after he's been dealing with their pride and their divisiveness and their divisions, he says, for who makes you differ from another? I think one of the translations says, what makes you so special? You know, I like to read different translations. That it kind of gives a broad aspect here. And, and what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Now, that's, there's the three questions all in one verse. And I want, I want you to keep in mind when it says, um, what do you have that you didn't receive? Let's be fair here. He's talking spiritually. Um, because in, in reality, some of us could say, well, I worked hard for this car. I worked so many hours, or I worked, I worked hard to get this physique. I know that's what you're wondering. How did I get like this? You know? But, but there's, a, you know, we could, there's some things we could attribute to hard work and saving your money and being frugal. And there's some things you can't in the flesh. But spiritually speaking, it's a whole other ballgame. Paul's saying, what do you have, spiritually speaking, your spiritual gifts and those things that you may be proud of that you didn't receive from the Lord, right? Because in the flesh, there's an exception here. So let's look at those three questions. The first one is, who makes you different from another? That's right there in, in, in verse 7. And your fill-in for this is, is here. Notice Paul says, who makes you different from another, not what. You see that? Now, we're all different. And you could look at me, and some of you think he's different, you know. And we're, some are more different than others, okay. But what Paul's trying to get across is, if there is anything special about you spiritually, who gets the credit? Not what. Who made the difference? And there's a, a spiritual gifting <coughs> that one has, you know, there is a spiritual gifting that, that one has and another doesn't. If, the, if that's the case... It's due to God's ordination. Let me give you a, a text of Scripture to consider with this. And it's in 1 Corinthians 12 when he's talking about the spiritual gifts. Uh, Paul says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. That means every single one of you have a gift. You may not have discovered it yet. You may not know what it is. But every one of us, the Spirit, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one. Who's it, what's it given for? So that I can be special. No, it's for others. You know, that's a weird thing about God's gifts. When you get a gift at Christmas or birthday, you can say, this is mine. It was given to me. When God gives you a gift, it's for others. When God gives you, it's so that you can bless others. He blesses you so that you might be a blessing. Okay? Stop. Oh, I will spend the rest of my time in this text if I don't force myself to keep going. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the workings of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another uh, different kinds of tongues. I'm so proud of myself. I'm not stopping to explain all those. We've talked about these before. To another, oh, I'm proud. To another, the interpretation of tongues, uh, but one and the same Spirit works all things, look at this now, distributing to each one, each one individually as He wills. When God gives you a gift, it isn't because, oh, they deserve a good gift. Let's really give them a good gift. They deserve this. Nothing you get from God you deserve, okay? you got to realize it's all grace. And so uh, when you get a gift, praise the Lord, He gave it as He wills, but guess what? Now you've got a responsibility to bless others with the gift he's given you. Whatever you know your gifting is, you need to be using it for others, for his glory. Okay, let's look at the second question here. The second question is found in the middle of verse 7. What do you have <clears throat> that you have not received? All right, now your fill-in is this, in case you miss it. The question is designed to make you grateful and humble rather than proud. Look at this again, the question. What do you have that you have not received? If you know that God has given you a gift, 
The question is designed so that we can go, oh God, thank you. I'm humbled that you would even give me this. And so Paul is trying to help them to be grateful and humble rather than proud, you see? Because receiving a special gift for birthday or Christmas or any time, it doesn't mean you're special, just you're blessed. Thank you. Have you ever re received a gift and then went around going, yes, yes, I'm very special because I have this gift. What did you do? It was a gift. It's ridiculous to think that you could be proud of a gift. You could be happy about a gift. You could be proud that you get to wear that new watch or drive that new car or whatever has been given to you, but for crying out loud, don't be proud about it. Be grateful. Be thankful. Be humble. Now, the, the third question, and we're going to try to move fast because the, we're, we're going to get into the contrast. We're looking at the three questions first. The third question in verse 7 is, why do you boast as if you had not received it? You know, step by step, Paul is trying to get them to think a little bit. Can you imagine someone bragging because God saved them? Yes, yes, yes. You know, you, you get to heaven and go, let me tell you why God saved me. <laughs> Just so you don't miss it, here's the fill-in. There are no braggarts in heaven, you know? I mean, the, nobody in heaven will be able to go, and, yes, let me tell you why God saved me. Let me tell you why. I'll tell you why God saved you. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. It's amazing grace that saved you. It's not because you deserved it. Nobody gets saved because they deserve it. Amen? You know what I'm saying. Okay, so uh, I, that's why that song, we haven't done that in a while. We'll have to do that sometime. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Oh, I was out in the hallway, didn't I? Sometimes I go, how's Sunday school doing? I'm all over the place. See, you know what? If you guys see me roaming the halls Sunday morning, I say, get back in there and worship. Because usually that's my discipline is I need to worship God, and I try to get in there. But I do get distracted sometimes. Okay. Embarrassing. <laughs> so here's a, here's a quote from uh, my friend David Gusak. He says, these three questions should prompt other questions in my heart. Do I truly give God the credit for my salvation? Do I live with a spirit of humbleness and humble gratitude? See, seeing that I've received from God, what am I trying to give to God? Do you want to just bless God back, you know? So now let's look at, I told you those three questions and four contrasts. I'm going to watch the time. We've got plenty of time. Three more hours, okay? So we're going to look now at the contrasts that Paul, actually I call it uh, sanctified sarcasm, okay? Uh, God, do you know God can be sarcastic? I'll have to do a study on that sometime and show you some of the real sarcastic things God has said, in the, especially the Old Testament. <coughs> Excuse me, water boy. <clears throat> okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the, the remainder of our text today in the New Living Translation. I want you either just to listen or, or, or watch it on the PowerPoint because we're going to put it up on the screen for you. And I want to see, see if you can see these contrasts, what we're going to look at today. Paul goes on to say, You think you already have everything you need. You think you are already rich. You have, become, you have begun to reign in God's kingdom without us. I wish you really were reigning already, for then we would be reigning with you. Instead, I sometimes think God has put us apostles on display like prisoners of war at the end of a victor's parade, condemned to die. We have become a spectacle to the entire world, to people and angels alike. Our dedication to Christ makes us look like fools, but you claim to be so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are so powerful. You are honored, but we are ridiculed. Even now, we go hungry and thirsty, and we don't have enough clothing to keep us warm. We often are beaten and have no home. We work wearily with our own hands to earn our living. We bless those who curse us. We're patient with those who abuse us. We appeal gently when evil things are said about us. Yet we are treated like the world's garbage, like everybody's trash, right up into this present moment. I love the New Living Translation. Some of the ways the way it words things here. I especially appreciate verse 9 in the New Living Translation that says this. I sometimes think God has put us apostles on display like prisoners of war 
at the end of a victor's parade, condemned to die. We have become a spectacle to the entire world, to people and angels alike. I want to point out something before we look closely at these contrasts. This word spectacle, which is probably in all of your translations, uh, the Greek word for spectacle is theatron. Does that sound like anything? I'm not talking about Megatron. Theatron, theater. We get the English word theater from that. And so, you know, Paul is saying, I feel like I'm on stage and the whole world's laughing at me and looking at me. The, the, the word theater, it's actually a picture. Today we think of theater in a different way than they did back then because in the ancient world, the theater, think about the Roman Colosseum. It was brutal entertainment. The kind of entertainment the Romans took place in, you know, I mean, it took part in, I should say, that they loved, and of course, we do that today, too, with some of the movies we watch. They loved brutality. And they would go and see people thrown to the wild beasts and gladiators fighting, and, and uh, that's what they did. And so the main event at the end of these, these gladiator events, when they were all over, the poorest and weakest prisoners would be brought in to fight beasts. And nobody expected too much of a fight, actually. But that's the picture that Paul is giving to his readers. Is I, I feel like I'm in one of those theaters that they're just watching me get mauled. They're just watching me get brutalized. Uh, the New King James Study Bible puts it like this, concerning spectacle. Spectacle alludes to the public executions carried out by the Romans. In these executions, Condemned men were brought into the Colosseum where they were tormented and killed by wild animals as cheering crowds looked on. Paul, Paul pointed out that the whole world and the angels were witnesses to the humiliation of God's servants. It wasn't a proud thing like watch me win. It was watch me die. As a matter of fact, I heard that one of the things that the gladiators would shout out uh, as they marched before the the emperor on the way to the Colosseum, they'd raise their sword and they'd say, we who are about to die salute you. Like, that makes American Ninja Warrior look weak, huh? This is something. And as a matter of fact, even on the way after a war, they would do the same thing. They would, they would all march in and when they're victorious after a war, all of the heroes would walk in with their armor and, and, and then in the last of the parade, they'd bring in the prisoners. And the prisoners would have to walk, and they're chained, and they're often naked and humiliated. And all we know, people would throw stuff at these prisoners at the end of the parade, and they're on their way to die in the Colosseum. So that's the picture that Paul paints of himself. That's part of the contrast. Let me tell you the contrast here now. And let's look at it again in the New King James in verse 8 and 9, and I'll make sure you don't miss it. Uh, Paul says in verse 8, You are already full. You are already rich. You have reigned as kings without us. And indeed, I could wish you did reign, that we might also reign with you. I think that God has displayed us apostles last as men condemned to death, so that, for that we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. Your first contact, uh, contrast, and it's in your fill-in, is reigning kings versus prisoners condemned to die. Now, keep in mind, Paul is actually being sarcastic. He's trying to humble the, Christian, the, the Corinthian Christians and let them think about it, what you're doing. But also consider this. I'm wondering how our positive confession friends would take this text because Paul is not speaking positive confession. Paul is not saying, I am rich. He's saying, you're rich, I'm poor, you're king, I'm going to die. Paul was not making a positive confession, was he? And so pay close attention to the apostle. It's as if he's saying, boy, you, you Corinthian Christians have really arrived. You're already receiving all the rewards of heaven while we're stuck here in purgatory, right? I mean, it, it's, it's godly sarcasm, I would say. Now, uh, one commentator, G. Campbell Morgan, says this. Though Paul uses strong sarcasm, his purpose isn't to make fun of the Corinthian Christians. He wants to shake them out of their proud, self-willed thinking he was laughing at them with holy laughter and yet with utter contempt for what they had been doing. And, and let me just ask you, has God ever embarrassed you to humble you? Has he ever shown you a good picture of yourself? Um, 
or maybe maybe it's the critique of others. I, I remember years ago, um, my, it came from my family that that I was so involved in church, I was so involved in religious activities and serving the Lord that um, I really hardly ever saw my mom and dad. I hardly ever, you know, my family they'd have parties and they'd have get-togethers, and I'm busy serving Jesus, you know. And something my brother said, I don't even remember it, but something one of my brothers said really hit me that I thought, is that how they see me? Sometimes that's what it takes. That you hear a word that really cuts, that shows you a picture of yourself that you go, wow, is that, is that really what I look like? That's why we have mirrors, by the way, so that you can see what you really look like, so that you can fix it. But boy, I remember I thought, you know, I need to spend more time. I need to visit my mom and dad. I need to care about my brothers when there's a birthday party with the nephews and nieces. I need to be involved because I got so busy serving Jesus that I had been neglecting my family. So be open to the, rather than defensive and have an excuse for everything. Be open. The Lord sometimes uses a little cutting remark to convict you that you go, wow, I hear you, Lord. I'm going to change. And, that, and that's what Paul is working at. Let's look at the second contrast, and that's in verse 10, the first part. He says, we are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. And so we are fools, but you are wise. And all of this is like puffing them, actually putting them on a pedestal, but it should really be embarrassing them. And once, you know, I don't know if you remember when we were going through the book of Acts, but we learned that Paul was once a highly esteemed rabbi. He was, he was a high-ranking rabbi, greatly esteemed by others, and he gave it all up for Jesus. He actually went from highly esteemed to totally demoted, and they, they thought they wanted to kill him. They thought he was the scum of the earth. And often that happens. I don't know if, if you know others like that. Maybe you've read about people's biographies, or maybe you're one of those people, that when a man or woman of high rank in the world's eyes becomes a Christian, they're, they're soon quickly viewed as fools. What are you giving up? What are you thinking? They, became, they become fools for Christ, as verse 10 says, or fools for Christ's sake. And this is often the way the Lord works, that, that once somebody who everybody praises and worships becomes a Christian, if they really become a Christian, not just work it, you know, there's the jailhouse religion stuff, but they really become a Christian, you give up a lot. Because now you, you put the priority of heaven. You put the value system of heaven above the value system of earth. And, and that is what we're talking about today, conflicting value systems. That was the title of the message. There's contrast in value systems. And so when we explained, one time when, when Paul was explaining, he's writing in 2 Corinthians, he was explaining about a vision that he had. He said something interesting. In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 6, he says, even if I should boast, he's talking about having this vision and being transported to the heavenlies. Even if I should boast, and this is from the NIV, by the way, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so no one will think of me more than is what is warranted by what I do or say to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassing greatness revelations. There was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Now I'm going to stop a second. God, what Paul is saying is because I experienced such blessings in, in the heavenly realms, the Lord gave me a weight to carry, a thorn in the flesh, a pain, so that it wouldn't get puffed up. Now I want to keep reading, but what comes to mind is I knew a man uh, back in the old Jesus movement days who had tremendous spiritual gifts. He had he was one of these guys that he'd pray for somebody, they'd get healed. I mean, I, I, he was a, a, kid, a kid I grew up with. I, I knew him in junior high, and then I went to high school with him. And, you know, when it, when it was a three-day, four-day weekend, and all the kids wanted to go out and party, I'd say, what do you want to do, Steve? He'd say, let's go witnessing. I was so grateful that I grew up with kids like that, you know. And he was one of these kids that moved frequently in the spiritual gifts. And he, he would pray for people, like I said, and they'd get healed. But he always had sickness problems. I think the Lord balanced it off. Because he was so greatly used by the Lord to keep him humble, he was, it's funny, he was a worship leader. And uh, 
I'll tell it anyway. He was a worship leader. He played keyboards and he played guitar. And he, he'd go out to go sit down on the, on the bench to play keyboard, but he had hemorrhoid problems. So he'd have to go out with his donut. Ever see those donuts you have to sit on? Here he is, glorious, leading worship at church. He's walking out there with his donut. <laughs> sit it down, sit on it so he could sit through the whole worship time. And he'd lead worship and people would worship God. But his thorn in the flesh, it was in the lower part of his flesh. <laughs> the Lord has a way of keeping us humble. And if you haven't experienced it yet, you will. That's the way the Lord works. Anyway, I stopped in the middle of it. So I'm sorry. It goes on to say, Paul says, therefore, oh, I went to a different one. See what happens when he does. He says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. What an attitude Paul had. He goes, you know what? I got all these health problems. I can't see very well. I got to carry my donut. He didn't carry a donut. But it's like, you know what? But it's all to God's glory. God has a way. And if you've got problems, um, realize God knows what it takes to keep you in your place. And if you're greatly being used by the Lord and, and it's easy to get proud, he knows how to give you a special kind of donut to keep you in your place. Okay, just realize that. Now, Warren Worsby said something kind of strange. You have to really ponder it. I was going to put it in the um, fill-in, but I, I have too many fill-ins here. So just think about this. Interesting. Strength that knows itself to be strength is weakness. But weakness that knows itself to be weakness becomes strength. Kind of interesting. Got to think about that a while. I think that in the Christian world, in, Christ, in the thinking of heaven, the way up is down. The way to really be used by the Lord is to be humbled first. So this is the way the Lord works. And the truth is, from the viewpoint of heaven, our only real strength is when God gets glorified. Okay? As Paul said in verse 9 of the text I just quoted, and this is from the New King James, he said to me, this is what Jesus said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. That means sometimes God could work better in your weakness than in your strengths. You know, I've learned that over the years where there's times something goes wrong and I realize I lost my, I forgot my notes or I, we have movie night years ago and the movie didn't show up and I, things that go wrong. I, I learned to get excited. Everything's going wrong. God's got something special planned. You need to realize that. Our, our strength or God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. Therefore, Paul says, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Okay? Let's look at the fourth contrast. The fourth, fourth contrast is found in the end of verse 10, and it's distinguished versus dis dishonored. And this is your next fill-in. Distinguished versus dishonored. Let me again quote our friend Warren Worsby on this. He says, this was the crux of the whole matter. The Christians in Corinth wanted the honor that comes from men, not the honor that comes from God. They were trying to borrow glory by associating themselves with great men. Paul answered, if you associate with us, you would better be ready for suffering. We apostles are not held in honor, but we're despised. I think much of the Christian world, in America in particular, has it all backwards. They think the closer you are to God, the richer you are. The more you walk with Jesus, the healthier you are. You know what? Read your Bible. There's, you know, the, the, the word faith movement is just messing up people across America. And so be aware of that. You know, Paul goes on to describe in graphic detail what kind of life an apostle has. And so let's look at the rest of that. In verse 11, he says, to this present hour, we're both hunger we, and we thirst. We're poorly clothed. We're beaten. We're homeless. Claim that one, huh? In Jesus' name, I claim this. And we labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we endure, being defamed, we entreat. He's saying, even when all these bad things are happening to me, we just keep doing good. 
When people try to hurt us, we just keep blessing them. That's the apostle who's following Jesus, who did the same thing, who set an example of how we should live, what our mindset should be. Being defamed, we entreat. We have been made as the filth of the world, the offscoring of all things until now. So this is just the opposite of what some Christians want you to think. And some of the most famous TV evangelists, and they're on you know, uh, satellite radio and everything, they, they just won't tell you this stuff, but you've got to read your Bible to find it, okay? So as your pastor, I'm going to help you think biblically. You know how you help people think biblically? You read the Bible. Huh? And you study it, you study it carefully. And, and so this is thinking biblically. Now, let me read you, speaking of thinking biblically, a quote from Jesus himself in Luke chapter 9 <clears throat> when he was talking about what it's like to follow him. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, not exalt himself. Let him take up his limousine. No. Let him take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Why have we forgotten that? We're going to think biblically. He goes on to say, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? You realize that can happen? You realize there are people who have everything now and they're going to have nothing in the next life. There are people who are highly exalted and worshipped and praised by many in the world that they're not going to even make it to the kingdom of heaven. That's what Jesus is trying to get across here. What, what good is it if you gain the whole world now and lose your own soul? In many, many ways, the value systems and the priorities of the world are opposite of God's values and priorities. That's what I don't want you to see. Don't be deceived. We, are, we live in this world. We're, we hear it all the time. We watch TV. We listen, read the, listen to the news. We're always getting hammered and brainwashed to think wrong to take on the world's value system, the world's priorities. And the only way we're going to think biblically is to stay in the Word, to be people of the Word. It's funny. Uh, I remember hearing that uh, when, when Muhammad first began propagating Islam and the Muslims were spreading, he called Christians. He had a word for them. And if you read the Quran, you'll find this all throughout the Quran. He called Christians people of the book. That's what I want to be known as. Huh? That's, not a, that's not an insult at all. Oh, Mike Sass, oh, Calvary Chapel Eagle. Yeah, they're people of the book. You betcha. Okay? That's a good nickname. So, verse 12. Verse 12 says, We labor working with our own hands. Now, I already read all this, but I want to point out a couple more highlights before we close together. This also was a disdainful thought in the Corinthian mind. Because the Corinthians, in their love for Greek wisdom, they embraced the Greek idea that manual labor was fit only for slaves. And so if you were a blue-collar worker in, in Greece, it was like, yeah, they're just a blue-collar worker. I, I'm an orator. Those were the important people. And unfortunately, I think today, even in America, we have a little of that going on. So beware of that. It would offend one of God's apostles. Uh, it would offend them that one of God's apostles would actually work with his own hands. And remember, I've talked to some of you about Paul was a tent maker. That many times, sometimes he received enough money from donations and offerings that his way was paid. But many, many times, more than often, he would go into a town and he would make tents. That's what he did for a living. When you call him a tent maker, he made tents. And he would sell the tents and that's how he made his living. I think one of the most honorable ways a Christian could serve the Lord is tent making. I don't mean making literal tents. I mean working with your hands, with your business. You serve the Lord, but you be honest, upright, with integrity in your business, and you make money to pay your bills, and then you serve the Lord with your free time and with your money. That was my, you know what, that was my goal. I, was, I finally got to a place where I was making a good living 
in the lithography trade, and I, I, was, I was making good money, and then I was teaching a Bible study, and I was volunteering for a few things at the church, and one day my, pa my pastor called me in, hey, after church, I want to talk to you. Come on into my office. I'm thinking, oh, great, what's this, you know? He calls me, and he goes, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? Where's this going? You know, I says, I, I just want to serve the Lord. I'm good. He says, I think the Lord wants you to come on staff. Now, some of you might get excited when you hear that story. My heart sank. You want me to come on staff? <clears throat> because I was actually kind of proud to be a tent maker. I was actually kind of proud that I don't get paid for serving God. I work with my own hands, and I, I work, I have my own working hours, and then after hours, I serve the Lord, teach Bible studies, do convalescent ministry. I did worship. I did a bunch of different things. But I was maybe a little too proud of that. And the Lord says, you're going on staff, buddy. So interesting. But I think it's desirable to be a tent maker. Paul set that example. I think it's a very misleading thing when people go, I just want to go on staff full time for the Lord. You know, that could ruin a lot of people. I've seen it ruin a lot of people. I've seen people, now I'm professional. I'm full time on staff and the church pays me. I'm not going to even begin to tell you all the things that could go wrong there. Let's move on, okay? The other thing in verse 13 that I want to highlight is he says, being defamed, we entreat. Meaning, you know, even when people insult us, we bless. You know, bless those who persecute you. Bless and curse not, like Jesus says. Well, this was also an offensive idea to the Greek mind because they thought that a man was a wimp if he didn't fight back when somebody insulted him. You know, in the Greek mind, if somebody insults you, you kill him, you know? Uh, and, and so everything about Paul was just contrary to Greek thinking, and he was trying to get them to think biblically because the world is going to make you think one way, and the Lord wants you to think a whole different way. We need to stay in the Word so that we could think biblically. Now let's wrap things up by looking at the end of verse 13 when he says, we have been made as the filth of the world, the offscouring of all things until now. So the offscouring of all things, you know, some ancient Greeks, as I uh, did some study on this, uh, they had a custom of casting out certain worthless people into the sea whenever there was a plague. Like if there was a plague or a problem, you know, maybe you've studied a little bit of uh, world history. People like to blame, it's the Jews, or it's the blacks, or it's the and people racially motivated. There's a plague going through town, and they'll pick a certain people group and go, it's all their fault. And all of a sudden, they're going to kill them off, right? It, it, if you know history and all, that happens. And so in Greece, what they would do is whenever there was a plague or a famine or a problem, they would, they would cast people into the sea because Greece is surrounded by ocean, and they would call them, they would throw them in and say, be our offscouring. That was, a, that was a term they used, the term that Paul is using here. And the victims were called scrapings or scrapings of the scum of humanity, for humanity, you know. And they'd throw them into the ocean, and they believed that they'd be wiped away, you know, when they scraped them out of society and threw them out, they were wiping away the guilt of the society, and, and the, the plague would disappear, the famine would go away, whatever they're dealing with. And so Paul may have been having a double meaning here when he said, said this. He was using the word filth and offscouring. He may have both meaning uh, we are despised, but we're also a sacrifice on your behalf. You know, they're, for your sakes, they're saying, we're, we're plagued with this Christian plague. Let's, let's get rid of Paul. He's an offscouring. He's the scum of the earth, you know. Kind of interesting. So what, what's the lesson here as we wrap it up? And here's your, your final fill-in of what is the lesson that we need to take home with us from today. Here it is. If we excel in the wisdom and value systems of the world, we will have a value system opposed to God. If you've got the world system all down and you, you fit right in with the world's value system and priorities, you're going to find yourself opposed to God's value system. Now, here's the second part of that. We must guard our hearts against worldly priorities and judgments and learn to think, guess what, biblically, okay? I'm, I'm going to beat it into you, uh, verbally speaking, that as your pastor, I, I want you, I want me, I want us to think biblically. Now let me get close with one more verse from 1 John chapter 2. What does it mean to think biblically? Here's another one. 
First John chapter 2, verse 15, John says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. He's talking about thinking biblically rather than worldly. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Folks, we're either going to think permanent, heavenly, or temporary, earthly. God help me. God protect me. God protect us from just being so caught up in the sensual things of this world, what we could see, what we could taste, what we could smell, what we could feel, the lust of the eyes, the, the lust of the flesh, the pride. Well, pride is a killer. That's what killed Satan. That's what destroyed him. Pride is a problem even to Christians. And so as we close in prayer together, I want you to think about what is God exposing in your life that needs tweaking a bit, huh? There's always something. Don't go, well, I'm, I'm good. There's always something God's trying to show you. There's always something God's trying to work in your life. Do you have the values and the priorities of the world? Or are your values and priorities of the kingdom of heaven? The permanent, eternal things, and you're thinking biblically. God help us to be people of the book, huh? Father, we bow before you. <clears throat> we just admit, Lord, that we need you and we're vulnerable. We're very easily influenced by the books we read, the movies we, we watch, the news we listen to, the friends we hang around with. Lord, there's so many things in our life that can influence us and tweak us. Advice we get from worldly people, that's wrong advice. Lord, we want to be the people of God led by the Spirit of God, and we want to be fully trained by the Word of God. And so we... we Open our hearts to you, Lord. We just say, Lord, if there's something wrong, something awry in our life, we totally say, Lord, we are yours. Put your finger on that which is wrong. Change us. Make us like unto your image. Help us to never be too old to learn new tricks. We want to always be willing to repent, forsake the wrong ways, and take on the new. Lord, help us to continue our journey and never think we're, we've arrived, but we move closer and closer to Jesus as we move closer and closer to the finish line. Hear our cry, Lord, as we worship you now in this song and receive our praise. Let's all stand and let's sing this song unto the Lord. And I want to remind you, if you need prayer for any reason whatsoever, that we will have a prayer team up to the front right side of the stage after church. Come get some prayer, but right now let's just close as we worship Jesus together.